Hello, fellow truth seekers. This is Barbara Jean. It's three o'clock in the morning. Just woke up, up, up about ten minutes ago from having a dream. Um, the dream's not really clear as to what it means, but I'm going to put it out there anyway. Um, it was a very long, complicated dream. Lots and lots of things going on. But a couple of things stood out that uh, some of it is already gone in my memory. I do remember being in the water. Some kind of baptism again. A lot of time the Lord puts me through the water, go into a bath or a pool or something, a river. Something is being done in the spirit. Anyway, I was in a uh, in the water in this dream, and I was swimming in this beautiful, beautiful crystal. It was like I was uh, on some kind of tropical island area, and uh, I was swimming to from one small little island. Um, it was a little tiny little. You know, I don't know what you call them, the toll or something. I can't remember. But it's just a little sandy, beachy thing. And then not too far away, I got in the water to swim towards the mainland shore, which wasn't very far. So it was just a casual swim. But nonetheless, I was in the water yet again. So every time I see myself in the water in my dreams, something has occurred. A death, if you will. A spiritual death has occurred of something in the flesh. <clears throat> I've had some very interesting things going on in my life. I'm not going to be able to go into them, but um, but just needless to say, um, Satan is working really over time to try to destroy to destroy the church, the the bride, the ecclesia, if that's what you want to call it. Um, he's working over time, but. He's not, he's not winning this battle. And <clears throat> so that's a good thing. That's a very, very good thing. As long as we stand our ground and remain faithful to Christ, he, Satan, he's trying very, very hard uh, to start a war, to destroy the people. Um, but God is holding them back. He's holding them back from being able to do what they want to do. Uh, they would have started a war several years ago if that was the case. They, they have they have a timeline and God is destroying their timeline um, of the new world order and they, the synagogue of Satan. They've got a timeline that they're trying to fulfill and God is, keeps interfering in their timeline. But anyway, <clears throat> getting back to this dream, then it's like I've got several things in my mind I want to talk about. I don't know whether I'm going to be able to remember everything, but <clears throat> we'll just we'll, we'll just have this little chat, okay? So. Anyway, something interesting in this dream happened, but, oh, should I talk about the other dream I had first? Mm, no, I think I'll talk about, okay, I could sort out what I'm going to say here. Um, okay, let me talk about this other dream I had first. Not that you would have known, but I had this dream a few days ago, a few nights ago, <coughs> and I've been pondering it ever since. And uh, anyway, I, I was watching the other night, uh, yesterday I was watching the Joseph story again, the one with Ben Kingsley, I think it's Ben Kingsley, who plays Potiphar. It's such, you know what, of all the Bible movies that I've seen produced, that is the most biblically accurate and interesting of all the Bible stories, the Joseph with Ben Kingsley who plays Potiphar. <clears throat> I think it was done a few years 10 years ago, 20, 12 years ago, I don't know how long ago, but it was done recently in, in recently in terms of, you know, it wasn't done um, back in the 50s or 60s, it was done back in like 2009, somewhere like that. And it's excellent. It is, if you haven't seen it, I highly recommend it. You can actually see it on YouTube. But um, excellent. The best of all the Bible stories that I've ever seen done done except for their Esther story was really good too not the one night with the king although I love it I love one night with the king but it, it, there's another Esther story that um, has I'm trying to remember uh, uh, another guy I can't he played was he was in uh, Amadeus like that call his name either anyway um, that was done again about 12, 20 years, 10 to 20 years ago, somewhere in there. And that was also excellent. Okay, I'm getting off topic. 
But um, I had a dream <coughs> a few nights ago that has me just quite disturbed in, in a sense that I don't quite understand it. Um, I've been pondering it. Um, but I, the Lord has shown me that it was, again, something is being, was being released from his people, a spirit, an evil spirit was being released that we, we probably didn't know was there, uh, didn't know it was affecting us that had the legal right to, um, infiltrate the church, but now has been removed. And anyway, to, it was a very graphic, in, in a sense, dream. It was a sexual dream. Um, and it was in, it had this woman in it. I, I felt like I was being raped by this woman, raped and seduced at the same time. And as the spirit was, it was very intense, this, this spirit was being exposed <clears throat> at the same time. And I, but I was under a heavy anointing. I was under a very heavy anointing and then the spirit left and I woke up <clears throat> and I was like what was that dear God you know what was that but I felt like it was coming up and out <clears throat> of me of my senses my spirit it was being released from uh, and it was being exposed for what it was so I started, like I said, I've been pondering it for a long, long time. I prayed about it. Lord, what does that mean? What was that? You know, it was a, it was a disgusting, it was horrible. It was an awful experience. But it was, and like I said, it was very intense. So I've been pondering it, wondering what that was. And then what's been coming to me is that it was the spirit of Babylon. And we said, oh, oh. I'm gonna have to, oh, hold on, I have to put you on pause. I lost my connection. Just a second. Um, it's right here, Revelation 17. Uh, I think there's other places that you could find, but this is the one that came to my mind, was that this spirit was being removed from her people. Why is this important? Well, because as the bride, God is removing all, uh, un, all lies and deceptions, all uncleanliness, from his his pride, there's there all the lies and deceptions, uh, spirits of uncleanliness, uh, 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 controlling spirits that have been in the church, dece deceiving spirits, uh, uh, demons, principalities, powers that we have been under, are being exposed for what they are, but also being released from his people. I hope that makes sense. Sometimes we don't even realize we're being controlled by these things. We don't realize we're being controlled by certain things in the church. Um, um, there are spirits that want to control us. And as we know, we've, we've come to, excuse me, I've come to that conclusion now, especially after what's been going on in my life in the last little while, which I'm not going to talk, be able to talk about too much, is that I have discovered that there are so many elements out there that are trying to control our movements. On an individual level, on a corporate level, on a business, on a ecclesiastic level, we are being controlled by spirits, by the lies and the deceptions that we have believed and have caved to, to cater to, didn't realize we were involved with, didn't realize we were pandering to, didn't realize we were being controlled by. We didn't realize we were being controlled by these spirits. And they have the they have the power to come into our lives and then influence us on different levels through other people, through circumstances, through, um, um, you know, and we're going, why is this, why is my, this is what I have done. Why is my life like this? Why do I keep running across this such and such and such a problem? Why can't I overcome? I've been praying for years and yet I keep running against the same situation, running into the same walls, running into the same, same set of circumstances that that won't allow me to progress to the next level or to 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 win this battle against such cer certain circumstances why do i keep running into this and that's because whether we know it or not or whether we're aware of it or not 
certain spirits have legal rights over us as long as the door is open to them and that we hadn't realized or exercised them. So anyway, this is what came to me after I had this encounter with this spirit. And I felt like I defeated this spirit because I rec recognized it was not a good spirit, but it was exposed to me that this spirit was seducing and also raping his people and raping his church, the same seducing spirit. And anyway, I'm going to talk about something in a second here. I, I keep, as I'm talking, these thoughts are coming to my mind. Um, anyway, let's read about this great prostitute, Revelation 17. This is where she's defeated. Revelation 17, 1. And there came uh, one of the seven angels, which had the seven vials, and talked with me, saying, Come, saying unto me, Come, hither, I will show thee the judgment of the great whore that sits upon many waters, with whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication, and the inhabitants of the earth have been made drunk with the wine of her fornication. So he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness, and I saw a woman sit upon a scarlet-colored beast, full of names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. And the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet color and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls, having a golden cup in her hand, full of abominations and filthiness of her fornication. And upon her forehead was the name written, Mystery the, ba Mystery, the Babylon the Great, the Mother of Harlots and Abominations of the Earth. And I saw the woman drunk with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. And when I saw her, I wondered with great admiration. And the angel said unto me, Wherefore didst thou marvel? And I will tell you the mystery of the woman and of the beast that carries her that hath the seven heads and ten horns. And the beast that thou sawest and is not and shall ascend out of the bottomless pit and go into perdition and they shall dwell. And they that dwell on the earth shall wonder whose names were not written in the a book of life from the foundations of the world when they beheld the beast that was and is not and yet is and here is the mind that hath wisdom the seven heads or the seven are seven mountains on which the woman sitteth and there are seven kings five have fallen one is and the other is not yet come and when he cometh he shall continue a short space and the beast that was not and it and that that was and is not even as he is the eighth and is the seventh and goes into perdition. And the ten horns which saw the ten are the ten kings which have received no kingdom as yet, but receive power as kings one hour with the beast. These have one mind, and they shall have power and strength unto unto the beast. They shall make war with the lamb, and the lamb shall overcome them, for he is Lord of Lord and Kings of King of Kings. They and they that are with him are called and chosen and faithful. And he saith unto me, The waters which thou sawest where the whore sits are peoples and multitudes and nations and tongues. And the ten horns which thou sawest upon the beast shall hate the whore and shall make her desolate and naked and shall eat her flesh and burn her with fire. For God hath put in their heart to fulfill his will and to, to agree and to give their kingdom unto the beast until the words of God are, shall be fulfilled. And the woman which thou sawest, the great city which reigns over the kings of the earth. So... There is a spirit of Babylon that has been controlling and manipulating humanity from the beginning of time, practically. This, she is a substitute Holy Spirit. She is the counterfeit Holy Spirit, the spirit of Babylon, this full of abominations and filth. And the, she's been counseling, this spirit has been counseling rulers and, and leaders and peoples of the earth since the beginning of, since the beginning of this whole downfall of man. Okay, you understand. If you're not listening to the Holy Spirit, then you're listening to this spirit. And this is the spirit that has been uh, raping and pillaging and seducing God's people since the fall of man. Okay? It's this spirit here. And her name is the mystery Babylon. Okay? She's the mother of all harlots. She is full of filthiness and abominations. And that's what I felt was... I was experiencing this spirit a few nights ago. And when I woke up, I was like, oh, what was that? Like I said, it was intense. And <coughs> um, I told you in the last couple of videos that I had been becoming aware that there was this 
spirit that's been trying to control me and even said so. And I realized what's going on is that I, because of the cleansing the Lord is putting me through, that this spirit isn't able to control me. And so it's it's fighting back as far to, as far as it can to try to bring the 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 bride back under her control and power. And it's not working. It's not working. Just that's 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 a good thing. Even though I had this dream, it was disgusting. But it showed me, and like I said, what I've gotten from it is that it's trying really, really hard to bring the people of God back under the control of this spirit, this Babylon spirit. And it's not working. So that's a great thing. This is a wonderful thing the Lord has shown me. It shows that we're closer, even closer, even closer to being that bride without spot or wrinkle. That um, fully covered, blood covered um, lamb, uh, red heifer, that's going to be cleansing the temple. I know you don't think that's what it means, but that's what that red heifer means. The red heifer is about the spirit cleansing the temple. Um, and I'm not going to go through all that. I've, I've gone through it before, and I'm not going to go there again. But that's what it means. And this means what I said when I had this dream. I've been pondering it, praying about it, asking the Lord what it means, and this is what's coming up. That that spirit is being exposed, that spirit's being expelled, that spirit is being exercised from his people that have this spirit has been controlling the church and whether we knew it or not we were seduced and we were raped by this spirit okay um and i think it has a lot to do with the church of pergamos and the church of pergamos um is the universal church we'll just call it the universal church if you don't know what that is you can look it up the universal church and what it means, where it comes from. It's the um, um, it's the city. It's a city. We all know what that city is, and that spirit has been controlling. We know that city has a lot to do with controlling people, and I don't think it started there. It started, like I said, it started at the beginning, at the fall of man, and that spirit just seems to have found a place to settle. That's this spirit, this, this harlot spirit has found a place to settle in that city. It starts with a V, kind of like something else that was trying to control us. It starts with a V. And in that city, who with people who are clothed in scarlet and purple, oh, you know what that city is, has been <clears throat> trying very, very hard to bring the people of God, it, it, I think about, you know, all the, uh, uh, since this, this spirit, this Roman spirit had <clears throat> been trying to, you know, we can't beat the Christians, we can't beat them, let's join them. And then they brought their paganism with them into this, into this the Christian ideologies and theologies. And then it has been controlling <clears throat> all kinds of governments with fear and manipulation and hidden truths, lies and deceptions. It's, it's got a lot to answer for and has persecuted the true people of God, burnt them at the stake, run them out of, out of society, taken over their business, taken over their money, <clears throat> killed them. On so many levels, this, this spirit, just like it says, has done everything in its power to bring the people of God, the true people of God, under its control. And the true people of God keep breaking free from her power. <clears throat> Over the years, look at all the things that people have had to do to break the power of this spirit. She's drunk with the, she's drunk with the blood of the saints, is what she says. Revelation 17, 6. And I saw the woman drunken with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. When I saw her, I wondered with great admiration, which is an interesting word. He was like, wow, look at that. That's amazing. But this woman is still in power, but not over the church. And I think that's what that dream is showing me, that that spirit has been exercised from his bride. We have now woken up. We, we were woke. <laughs> We've been made woke. But the true wokeness. And, and like I said, what after I had this dream, I immediately woke up 
Isn't that interesting? That Satan has counterfeited wokeness too. Christ wakes us up after a dream that is important for us to remember and wakes us up. We have been awoken. We've been woked. And now Satan has counterfeited that just like he's counterfeited the rainbow and counterfeited all kinds of the, and counterfeited spirit from this mystery Babylon is also a counterfeit of the true spirit, which is the Holy Spirit. So Satan is always trying to counterfeit a movement of God and wokeism. He can't stop the church waking up. So he's got to counterfeit it with his wokeness. And there's a lot of people being put to sleep by his wokeness. Whereas the church is being truly woken up to the evils of this, of, of Satan's synagogue, his synagogue of Satan. So isn't that interesting? I just thought, anyway, I thought I'd share that with you because it's rather encouraging to realize that the Lord has removed that spirit. We're no longer under the control of this spirit. And that's amazing. That's one huge, ginormous step towards being completely free of all lies and deceptions and controlling spirits that have had power over us. And that, why? Because we've been still had, standing firm, hold on to Christ Jesus, clinging to him because we are his bride. And so we cling to Jesus no matter what we see. Oh, that reminds me, I was watching um, um, the movie Son of God, uh, the one that was done not too long ago. Um, and it's okay. You know, like, again, it was uh, a movie that was supposed to be biblical-based. And there were some things that were good and some things that were not so good. Um, they, they, you know, people trying to make the scriptures more dramatic, so altering the way things were actually said or done. So, yeah. But anyway, uh, a couple of things I did find interesting was I did like the scene where Jesus was walking on water. That was really good. Um... <clears throat> But what really struck me about this this movie was when Jesus um, feeds the thousands with the you know few fish and loaves, and uh, and how the people wanted to um, make him king because he fed them, and they were going Messiah, Messiah, they were all screaming Messiah, Messiah after they got fed miraculously all these people i have to put you on pause for a second just a second hold that thought sorry about that um so he was um as as the people were you know were going messiah 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 trying to make him king wanting him to be king because he fed them with these few loaves and fishes um he gets this in the movie, he gets this very concerned look like, oh, no, 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 this is not the way it should be done. And he withdraws from the people, he withdraws from his disciples, and they're going like, well, well, I don't understand. They want to make you king. That was, a, I thought that was the whole point of all this, to make you king. Because you did this, you can do these miracles. And then he's like, no, no, this is not the way it is. And he left. And it made me think about the temptation of Christ in the, in the desert with Satan, of course, tempting him when he was at his most weakest point. In fact, he probably was on the verge of death. If he didn't eat soon, he would die. And that's how weak he was. He was on the verge of the most utter weakness. Um, Satan is always trying to, and he is, he's always trying to tempt people to take the easy route, to go, instead of taking the narrow road, to take the broad road, to take the easy road. And, and, that was the same temptation that he gave um, Jesus in the desert. It was the same temptation that we all face. The temptation for fame, fortune, and wealth. Fame, fortune, and... Fame, fortune, and... Uh, oh, fame, fortune, and... I always goes... I always... Okay, hold on, let me put you on pause for a second. Again. I don't know why I can never think of the word power. It just seems to go right over my head. I don't know why. Because I don't feel like I have any. So that word always seems to escape me. Fame, fortune, and power. He uses the same temptation to mankind. And you know what? Mankind always seems to fall. There's very, 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 very few people 
who managed to overcome that temptation on some level for fame, fortune, and power. And here was, you know, Satan was tempting Jesus yet again to take the easy route. His temptation in the desert didn't stop when he he confronted Satan and, and cast him out um, and overcame him with the truth of the word to say, no, I'm not going to take the easy road. I'm not going to take the, the broad road. I'm going to take the narrow road that usually always, always seems to lead to some sort of suffering. You know, uh, um, waiting on God and suffering for it and, and waiting and waiting and waiting and sometimes not having your answer, your prayers answered until, of course, the next, the next life, which is what Abraham had. You know, he died before he saw his promise fulfilled. God promised him this huge amount of property and he never possessed it. And he is still waiting for that possession of that land. If you because he promised him from the land from the Euphrates to the Nile and I mean it was a vast amount of property. So Abraham's still waiting for that promise. And he's dead. Okay? So Satan is was even then tempting Jesus to take the easy road when the people were going, Messiah, Messiah, because he had fed them in the desert or fed them when they were hungry. And he was saying, I, I really, like I said, I really appreciated the sitting going, I could see them going, you know, I could, it could be so easy to, to claim being king because I can do these miraculous things, but this is not the way to do it. This is not my road. My road isn't the broad path. My road isn't the easy way. I'm not here to take power now yet i'm here to change the world and i have to step back because satan is tempting me i am in temptation at this moment i could be made king because i can do this this and this and this and jesus withdrew he withdrew at that moment and said i'm not going to go there i'm going to get back into the obedience and the plan that my father has for me i'm not going to allow Satan to tempt me into taking the broad road. And like I said, I was I was thinking how easy it is for so many of us. We all are tempted to take the broad road because none of us want to suffer. And so many of us would prefer sorry would prefer the easy road or the or tempted to have the for the power, the fame and the fortune and all the things that that come with the easy road. And this is what the Lord is exercising from his people. He's exercising the broad road from his bride because we are on the, the same narrow path that he's on. The true people of God are on the same narrow path. And that is, no, we are willing to delay what we want for the future. We are willing to delay. We know that that's going to be ours. He promises us wealth. Guess what? We're going to be walking streets of gold. If you can't tell, say that's not wealth, not wealth, that's wealth. We are. He promises us wealth. Christ gives, wants to give us wealth, mansions to live with, every luxury you can even imagine, and beyond what we can even imagine. That's ours. But he expects us to delay it. He doesn't want us to think that we're having our best life now, that we're living our best life now. Because if you think this is God's best to have a mansion here on earth, that, that's going to be a mansion here on this earth has nothing to compare to the mansion that you're going to receive if you delay, allow God to delay that, that desire. I'm not saying that God doesn't want us to have means to take care of ourselves or to provide for others. That's not what I'm saying. But a lot of, I'm unafraid to say, and hate to say it, Christian people have been seduced, raped and seduced in by the spirit of Babylon into believing that they should have their best, best life now, take power now, take wealth now, take, you know, take possession now. But God is saying that is not the way. The way is through suffering. And when there is going to be a day when all the things that you desire will be yours. Power. He promised. Look at the, the church of, of uh, Thyatira. Look at uh, the church of Philadelphia. Look at the, the churches. He promises them power if they're faithful to suffer now. Suffer now in this world. He is promising them power. 
but it's delayed. So if you want power, you're going to have power. Christ had to delay his power by, by hanging on a tree. And Satan thought he had him. He thought he, you see, Satan thinks that power comes through physical, uh, physical uh, means like having enough guns and swords and shields and, and armory and all that sort of stuff. That, see, that's Satan's way of power. But Christ's way of power is more powerful than Satan's power. And yet it seems quite the opposite. It seems like you're making yourself weak in order to be, have power. But we are overcoming these spirits that say the opposite. You know what I'm saying? So this is what I'm saying with this dream I had, with this mystery Babylon spirit. Um, I The Lord was showing us we have overcome that spirit, that temptation of taking the broad road, the broad path of seduction and rape raping and pillaging and that spirit that has has led so many leaders to do exactly that rape and seduce countries and nations and peoples for more wealth power and and fame you know so anyway i just thought that was rather interesting to think about um i gotta scratch it got it you um so something to think about just something i thought was rather interesting uh, to ponder um, now where was I going to go with this? Um, oh, anyway, I, I, I don't remember exactly. I was going to go somewhere else with that. And I just don't, I don't recall where I was going to, what I was going to say. So it's just whew, right over my head. Um, yeah. So I just like thought that was a rather interesting part of the movie where I saw, I, I was really understanding I, I got an insight, let's put it that way. I got an insight uh, to something that I didn't didn't understand before. Why didn't Jesus allow them to proclaim him Messiah? And it was because he he knew that this this proclamation, this forced make you king because you could do these miracles, was taking the broad road. And that was not his path. And it's not our path either. As the bride of Christ, we have gone through hundreds, centuries of trials and tribulations and being pursued by these evil spirits to to compromise. To um, they've been we've been controlled, manipulated. Um, we've had witchcraft over us. We've had sorceries over us. We've had uh, religious spirits over us. We've had. Fornication spirits over us. We've had, we were, we've been infiltrated on so many levels. As the true followers of Christ Jesus, we have been infiltrated by wolves and sheep, sh wolves and sheep's clothing, blatant wolves with no sheep's clothing, just out to get us and devour us. Um, those who come into the church looking like sheep but are actually wolves, tears among the wheat. There are actually weeds and choking us out. We have been infiltrated on so many levels and the Lord is showing that spirit has finally been released and removed from his people. So that's a very encouraging word. Um, next, I want to talk about the other dream I had just this, not too, no, I'm going to go about an hour ago now. I had this dream and I, again, I saw myself in the water, which is what I told you earlier. But something interesting happened after I saw myself in the water. The dream moved from that to my friend Grace. Now, I've talked to you about my friend Grace. Um, I have been out of touch with Grace for many years now. But when I see her, and I don't see her very often in my dreams, occasionally I see Grace in my dreams. And the Lord showed me, and you've seen my little figurines, that Grace represents my friend Grace. Um, represents the Grace Church. And the Lord shows me that, um, she, you know, the, the Lord orders our paths. That's, and actually, that's what was in my dream, interestingly enough. It was about how God orders our paths. Um, anyway, I saw Grace in my dreams. And it, I, when I see her, I always know the Lord is talking to me about the Grace Church. Here's my little, my little, chart again rainbow coated foot reflexology the lord gave me this chart and i didn't you know i was thought was, i had put it away and then years later i pulled it out well there's the rainbow and there's the woman 
covered in the seven colors of the rainbow, which of course is very prophetic because it represents the seven churches. Anyway, the Grace Church is right here. She's blue and she represents water. She represents the lungs. She represents air. She represents the Holy Spirit. Um, she can represent communication. Okay. Um, also, real fun and relaxation. That's what the Grace Church also represents, fun, relaxation, which everybody needs every now and then to take the load and help get through life. Because if everything was just all work and no play, you know, your life would be miserable. So God has always provided a way for us to, like, well, he has feast days. He, you know, feast, feast days where you um, uh, can take a few moments of your time to rest and relax spend time with your family, remember to communicate, remember to be one with your fellow man, to to try to, uh, you have to have some kind of balance in your life, and, and fun and relaxation is part of it, fun, excitement, sports, something that takes you away from your work, um, so anyway, she represents the Grace Church, not just read about the Grace Church, you find the Grace Church mentioned in Revelation chapter 3, the Church of Sardis. I've talked about the Church of Sardis before. And uh, Sardis, if you look at the word Sardis, it's short for, if you want to put a couple of more letters on there, you could have sardines. Little fish, little oily fish. <laughs> Which was rather clever of the Lord. Um, so anyway, Revelation chapter 3, 1. And to the angel of the Church of Sardis write, these things saith he that hath the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. So the Sardis, the church of Sardis is there. The stars, if I think about stars, I always think of stars equaling fame. If you think about fame, so he mentions fame, you're famous. You, people love you because you're, you're easy to be around. Who doesn't like to have fun? Who doesn't like to relax? Everybody likes to relax and have fun from time to time. So you're famous because of that fact that you people like you. And if I think about my friend Grace, it's exactly what she was like. She's very, very gregarious, very fun to be around. She liked to relax. She liked to have fun. She liked to laugh. And um, so this is what the Lord was saying. You'll be very famous. You'll be well liked. You will be, um, people will find you pleasant to be around. Um, the spirit, of course, represents Spirit, seven spirits of God, the Holy Spirit. So she's filled with the Holy Spirit. I know thy works, thou hast the name that thou livest and art dead. So not a good thing. Like I said, you got the reputation, people like you, people think that you've got the actions, you're, you're where the action is. Yeah, you, so you draw people in because you have the reputation that you're alive. You're filled with the Holy Spirit. Woo you got life. And yet the Lord says to them, you are dead. Now that is sad but the truth it is the truth they believe that they are because they have the holy spirit that they have been set free from the curse of the spirit of death but because they haven't yet been baptized for the most part well most charismatic churches don't believe in baptism in water and that's really strange because if you think about the church of sardis it's about blue it's about being an ocean i'm going to see, get my little figurine down and just show you my little figurine hold on just a second i wasn't going to but i'm going to do it let's hold on okay so here's my figurine for the grace church and i've gone over this if you haven't seen these little figurines the lord gave me these figurines like i said my step the lord orders my steps so incredibly you i mean it shocks me sometimes too when i see look back at my life and see how the Lord has ordered my steps so precisely in so many ways and still orders my steps in so many ways that it's, it's really quite remarkable. Miraculous is what it is. Anyway, this is my little Grace Church figurine. And she is holding the baby. She's holding a baby and the baby's holding a star. Isn't that interesting? This he says, Revelation chapter 3, 1, and if the angel of Sardis write these things, he that has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. And we have a baby. She's holding her baby. And the baby is holding a starfish. A starfish. <laughs> there is the word fish. He's holding a starfish. A star and a starfish in, her, in, the, in the baby's hand. She's got bare feet. She's got her swimming outfit. This is an old-fashioned swimming outfit. She's got her hair tied back. 
in in cute little pig ponytails and that cute so cute that's a cute little figurine i love this figurine and she's got a little red bow on down there but she is ready for the beach and it's so funny like i said that the church of sardis for the most part are unbaptized believers unbaptized believers because they don't believe in works that's exactly what he says here they don't believe in works so because they don't believe in works even getting into the waters of baptism is a work as far as they're concerned so because you are there you don't want to be saved by works they abdicate not having any work and i think it's rather ironic and even hypocritical if you think about it because here's this beachcomber ready for the beach to relax and have fun on the beach but she's not willing to get in <laughs> even though she's an oily fish she doesn't want to get back in the ocean she just wants to lie by it and and and, and relax and have fun by the sea and maybe get her dar garments a little dirty but the lord says you got to keep your garments clean and we're going to get to that in a second so like i said i saw my friend who represents this church in this dream that i had just an hour ago okay and in fact she kind of looks like grace grace was blonde <laughs> i don't know why it's so funny um so and she loved to sunbathe she loved to sunbathe um so that's why when i see her i know the lord is talking to me about this church something is going on with this church now i'm not sure exactly what it is but it's also his spirit that's part of his bride his bride encompass all these things all these aspects the the bride isn't just one thing the bride is all of these aspects all put together because that's what makes us perfect without spot or wrinkle so god is showing us that the spirit of grace and there are there's a, a church that has divided itself we, we've been divided the church has been divided into several parts because of false teaching and false doctrines and lies and deceptions and those wolves and sheep's clothing has divided us and yet god is also putting together his bride from every aspect of it of this we are one we are made whole through christ jesus who makes us a full seven you know and in that there's the movie with dudley moore called 10 with bo derrick that's interesting i can remember her name bo derrick and she was a 10 we called it called a 10 Mm, that was actually that she was you know he was looking at her as this i think the spirit of babylon you know because what if she's got 10 horns she was a 10 10 is not a good number in the bible i have to tell you 10 isn't 10 isn't a desirable number it's not the number for perfection in god's economy god's number for perfection is seven isn't that interesting it's not a 10 and yet like i said in man's way of looking at this a woman is perfect if she's a 10 or a man's perfect if he's a 10 isn't that interesting and yet 10 is not really a good number 10 isn't the number of 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 good things in the bible for the most part from, from what i remember 10 is not a number that you really want to uh, associate with because the 10 spies the 10 the 10 spies that said no we can't do it out of 12 he said they sent 12 spies into the land 10 came back with a bad report 10 laws that we can't keep <laughs> um uh, 10 horns 10 tribes that uh, that uh, 10 brothers that uh rejected joseph you know 10 is not exactly a good number in the bible but seven is so god is looking for a perfect seven in his bride so we are incorporating all of this into our into the perfect bride we are the bride of 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 um we we are obedient to god's laws in in a sense that we are not the we've been fulfilled in other words in christ jesus when we are baptized into jesus christ we have fulfilled the law okay because christ fulfilled the law god sees us when you're baptized into jesus he god sees you have fulfilled the law we are also obedient to sacrifice because that's what being baptized into Christ means. When you're baptized into Jesus Christ, you're sacrificing your life. You're dying to yourself. That's what the scriptures say in Romans 6. When you go into the waters of baptism, you are you're accepting the suffering of Christ Jesus and death to your own self-will. 
That's what it means. That's part of what all this means. The Church of Pergamos, which is a spirit of knowledge. We are adding knowledge to um, to help uh, overcome the spirit of the of the the kingdom of of deception. You know, we we are we are overcoming being destroyed for a lack of knowledge because we are gaining knowledge because um, uh, we're in the university of the knowledge of good and evil. That's what that represents. We are uh, in the, through Christ Jesus also. We, this is all coming through Christ Jesus and he's giving to, he's rewarding us with it, us with it because that's his spirit and his spirit is infiltrated us through the Holy Spirit. We have received that spirit and that's how we're overcoming, which goes back to my first dream I was talking to you about. We are overcoming these evil spirits that have infiltrated the church because God is infiltrating us with the spirit of Christ and the Holy Spirit and setting us free, cleansing the, our temple so that one day when he comes to take us home to live with him in his temple, in his house, we will be fully acceptable because we are, we, we are without spot or blemish because we have overcome all these spirits including the spirit of this, uh, um, um, the spirit of mystery Babylon. Isn't that amazing? We are, we are being exercised from all these powers and principalities that have controlled us over the centuries. So then, of course, you have the church of Thyatira, which has to do with the Jezebel spirit. We, this is the spirit of, this is the, the spirit of power and works. It's the church of Thyatira, and that's part of who we are. Like I said, every last one of these churches, as we become a seven, we are receiving every last thing, and it's all in Christ Jesus. Christ overcame through his works, and we also have that same spirit in us through water baptism. His spirit comes to our spirit. Then also the spirit of grace, the spirit of mercy, the spirit of relaxation, the spirit of letting go of works and saying, okay, you know, uh, the Lord's got it all handled. I don't have to worry about this. I'm not going to be... Um, uh, controlled anymore by by works. The works are are part of who I am, but I also have time for relaxation. I can have time to breathe and laugh and smile and sit by the ocean and enjoy God's creatures and you know in this in the sea and just have time to play, play and relax, and also enjoy some fame. Okay, <laughs> and then of course you got the Church of Philadelphia, which is understanding brotherly love which is the spirit that joseph had the spirit of 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 brotherly brotherhood understanding that we are all one in christ jesus and then there of course there's ultimate power and judgment when we are given the spirit of wisdom and the crown of wisdom which is what this church here represents the church of laodicea the wine the wine uh, of overcoming the antichrist spirit even if it means our death so Interesting. So God is making us a seven. Now let's get back to this church because I saw, like I said, I saw this dream. I saw grace. Let me actually tell you the dream and then I'll finish with this, this um, chapter. Um, so in this dream, I saw grace and she looked really good. I have to say she looked really, really good. And, and I was saying to her, you know, grace, I, I didn't ever want us to have, um, contention between us now if you can think about this in the way that since god is making us one you know every last one of these spirits is going to be part of his bride okay he so even though in the spirit in the physical realm i haven't had contact with grace my friend grace grace still represents a spirit he rep grace represents something that is in his church that needs to be understood and come um to resolve a conflict in ourselves as the bride of Christ, we have to overcome a conflict. And so the Lord is showing me something in this dream that God, as a church, as the bride, we are overcoming a conflict in ourselves that is being resolved in the spirit. Okay, so this dream that I had was something that was going on in the spirit realm that God is showing me that a conflict is being resolved in that it's going to make us even more perfect and removed the, removed the, um, the conflict that we have in ourselves when it comes to grace. 
Okay, I hope that makes sense to you. Like I was showing you, uh, the, each one of these colors represents something in ourselves that has to be overcome. This is the ultimate thing that the last thing we have to grow is the overcome the spirit of the Antichrist. The Antichrist spirit has to be overcome in the bride in order to be perfect. We are overcoming the synagogue of Satan in this one. We're overcoming the spirit of laziness in this one. We're overcoming the spirit of of Jezebel in this one, we're overcoming the spirit of Pergamos, the synagogue of uh, the the throne of of the um, anyway the, the the seat of Satan in this one. We're overcoming the spirit of of, of um, not wanting to be the fear of death in this one, uh, the, the uh, religious spirit on this one. So these are things that we are overcoming in ourselves in order to be that spotless bride in order to be able to be brought into the temple, which is what he promises the Church of Philadelphia, that we're pillars in the temple. We're crowned with wisdom. That is our goal, okay? And how we are being made perfect through these things. And so the, when I saw grace in my dream, I know I'm sounding very choppy, I'm just doing my best to try to explain this. When I saw my friend Grace in this dream, it was to indicate that something in the spirit of his church and his bride was being overcome. A conflict was being resolved in the spirit realm because that's how I felt. When I saw grace, I felt like something is going to be resolved between us. And that's exactly what happened in the dream. Um, because in my spirit, in my own spirit, in I'm speaking personally, I sometimes feel at odds with the spirit of grace. I feel at odds with how I feel or how I have dealt with or how I uh, respond to the church through the grace church. Okay. And many of you who've been with me for a long time understand that I have a conflict with this spirit that says, um, we're alive, we're alive, we're alive. And I'm saying, you're dead, you're dead, you're dead. That's the conflict that I have with this church. And it's the, not my conflict. It's what God says here. You understand what I'm saying? This is the conflict that I have within myself as well. If you think about it, um, I'm alive, I'm alive, I'm alive. No, you're dead because you haven't got the works. You know what I'm saying? So here's Christ trying to say to this church, you, you, have, you think you're alive. You think that you have overcome the spirit of death but you have and the only way to overcome the spirit of death to conquer that spirit of death so that there is no condemnation no spirit of death in you is water baptism there is no other way to overcome the spirit of death as much as you you're charismatic and you use the holy spirit and you're praising god and you're doing all the things that look great and look good and sound good but the reality is you are still dead you haven't found the truth let me just show you what i'm talking about I wasn't planning on going here, but I'm going to go here anyway. Uh, they always read Romans. The Grace Church loved to read Romans 10 about, you know, if you say the, you know, that you confess Christ with your mouth and then you are saved. But then they ignore the baptism part, which is in Romans 6. <clears throat> so I, this is this is the conflict I'm having because the Grace Church just says, "Oh, just speak with your mouth, and then you're you're good to go in the rapture," which isn't scriptural. It's not biblical, but they can't see it and they refuse to see it. And they say, "I'm alive now. I'm alive. I'm alive." And Christ is saying, "You have the reputation of being alive, <clears throat> but you're actually dead." And what makes them dead is that they have not yet been set free from the curse, <clears throat> the curse of the spirit of death. Um. Let me just see if I can find it. Hold, let me put you on pause for a second. I've got too many mice and too many things all stuck here. Just a second. <clears throat> okay. Romans 8.1. There, there is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ has set me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his own sight, son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and for sin, condemned sin in the flesh. So they don't realize that they have not yet been set free from the spirit of death. Therefore, they're still dead. If you haven't been set free from the spirit of death through obedience, then you are not alive like you think you are. 
you have the reputation everybody's flocking to you because you're the grace church and you're so much fun you've got all the the, the, the gizmos and all the lights and the, the, the guitars and the blah 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 and the drums and everything seems so lively and full of fun and everyone's having a great time but you are not set free from the from the spirit of death and how are you set free from the spirit of death well you gotta die you gotta die to be set free from the spirit of death and the only way to be set free from the spirit of death is to be baptized and that's in Romans 6 know you not that as many of us were baptized in Jesus Christ were baptized into death therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death that as like Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father even so we should walk in newness of life what why are we when we come up in waters of baptism you let go of the spirit of death the spirit of death is no longer on you as far as God is concerned you've died now you are not, you're, so those who have not gone into the waters of baptism, although you have the reputation that you're alive, you're actually dead. Okay, makes sense? But if you go into the waters of baptism, you die. And as far as God is concerned, you're now alive. When you come up out of the waters, God sees you as not as dead. You can never die again, even though in the flesh you, you might give up the spirit. God sees you as alive. Isn't that an interesting contradiction? It, it, it's not a contradiction in, in Christ, but in the world it is. But as far as God is concerned, when you go into the waters of baptism, into Christ Jesus, you're being baptized into Jesus, and you rise up and you've left your old man behind, and now you're alive in Christ. So that's the only way to be set free from the spirit of death is to be going into the waters of baptism. And the, what God has a problem with this church is that they have the spirit of, of, of being alive, but they're actually dead and they don't know it. Because they have the seven spirits, because they're famous, because they, people like to be around them, they got, seem to have everything go, going for them. People love the, the fun and the, and the relaxation that they get from this church, and the, the fun, the ease, whatever, the fame. And yet they don't realize that they have, as long as they have not, have refused to be identified with Christ's death, burial, and resurrection, you are still under the spirit of death. Okay, makes sense? So this is the conflict that I, I struggle with, with this church. And I've talked about it many, 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 many times. How I struggle with this church because of their refusal to accept the fact that their works, that faith through, um, um, who is it? Is it James? Or was, who says that uh, faith without works is dead? And this is what happens here. They they claim to have faith, <clears throat> yet they refuse to have works. And yet faith without works is dead, which is what's happened here. They are dead because they refuse to have works. They refuse to get into the waters of obedience because they claim it's a work and they don't want to have anything to do with work. Though if therefore they remain dead. And they don't, they don't know it. So I, I struggle. I struggle internally with this church. And I have struggled on YouTube with this church. I have claimed it over and over and over and over again, trying to show this church the error of their ways through the scriptures, and they refuse to accept it. So this is the conflict I have within myself. And the Lord is showing that this conflict is finally finding some resolution through this dream that I had. Some resolution has been coming through in the spirit realm for on my behalf on my own behalf personally but on the behalf of the church corporately okay so <clears throat> let me get back to the dream uh, <clears throat> so in roman uh revelation chapter three let's go back to the church of sardis here <clears throat> okay so i see i see grace in my dreams she and i are in the same room together for some reason we we were in this room and I said oh, she looked really really good grace looked great uh, <clears throat> but she was always put together well it always looked fabulous beautiful um, she was smiling we were smiling at each other and I said to her I said grace listen it was never my intention for us not to have a relationship with each other it was never my intention for us to have been broken in friendship with each other that was not my my desire my desire is for us to always have friendship with each other on some level i always wanted us to be friends with each other because i like you you're my friend i, I love you okay i don't know if exactly what i said but that was the intention of my 
when I was communicating with her, I said, we need to get back together as friends. And now, interestingly enough, my sister, uh, my twin sister, who in my dreams represents the Church of Pergamos, and I'm not going to go into why that is, but she, in my, when I see her in my dreams, the Lord is usually speaking to me about the Church of Pergamos. <clears throat> so, she actually, <laughs> so, funny, so funny to say, she was actually the one that caused this riff between Grace and myself. It goes back years. And I'm not, I'm not really going to go into it too deeply. Just to say that I had gone on a trip with Grace and my sister. And an argument arose because of my sister and Grace. See, I didn't have a problem with Grace at that moment. But my sister had an argument with Grace. And as a result of it, that's what caused this Grace and I to no longer be friends. She was in the room with us. She came into the room as I was speaking to Grace. She came into the room and spoke to Grace as well and said in the dream, Grace, I'm sorry about, you know, that this problem that we've had between us. And so it was like, okay, this is what, this is what caused the rift between Grace and myself was this, this other person, my sister. Interesting, like, like I said, my sister represents in my dreams the church of Pergamos and this is the church of Pergamos which I believe is the church that has the spirit of the whore of Babylon now, that's not to say that I think my sister is the whore of Babylon because she's not but I just think it goes together I think that this this whole thing God is showing me that we're being set free from that spirit because this resolution came between me and grace in the dream me and the grace church like i said represents myself personally represents myself corporately as the bride represents some spirit that something that was occurring in the spirit realm excuse me that is being resolved and a conflict that is being sorted out and has been sorted out in heaven. The Lord has given me a heads up. And as is the church, as the bride, a heads up that something has been resolved in the spirit that has been a problem. So here is the church of Pergamos in its Revelation chapter 2, 12. And to the end of the church of Pergamos write these things, saith he that hath the sharp, the sharp Sword with two edges, I know thy works and where thou dwellest, even where Satan's seed is, and thou holdest fast my name and hast not denied my faith. Even on those days and where an Antipas was my faithful martyr, who was slain among you where Satan dwelleth. But I have a few things against thee, because thou hast there them that hold the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balak to, to cast a stumbling block before the children of Israel to eat the things sacrificed to idols and to commit fornication. So this church represents a stumbling block that has been in the church. Isn't that interesting? I'm putting it all together as I'm speaking to you right now. <laughs> as I'm speaking to you, these dreams are making more sense to me. That this church, this church of Pergamos, has cast a stumbling block before us. And the stumbling block is the doctrine of Balaam and fornication and idolatry. And this, uh, thou also hold them, thou hast also them that hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which things I hate. Now, in my dream, or in real life, my sister cast a stumbling block between me and my ability to have a friendship with my friend Grace. A stumbling block. Which I think is amazing. This is an incredible, like the Lord orders my steps in such a way that I, it's amazing when I look back at it going, wow, that's why that happened. That's why that incident happened. That's why things that seem so minor and so incidental, coincidental, whatever. But when you look back at it, there's so many things that just keep playing out. And I'm going, oh, okay, now I get it. No, 
That's why I had a boyfriend in, in college called Christoph. Isn't that amazing? That, you know, it's amazing. So he, in this dream, I, Bev, my sister Bev, who represents the Church of Bergamas, comes into the room, and I'm resolving my conflict with Grace, and she resolves her conflict with Grace. So therefore, what? A stumbling block has been removed. A stumbling block has been removed that is going to allow a flow of energy. And this is what happens when there's conflict. There's a blockage of energy. That makes sense? There's a blockage of energy that uh, doesn't allow the body to function properly. If there's a blockage of energy here and in, in your works towards the Lord, it's going to block energy from going this way and from going that way. But the Lord is removing. So this is this energy here and this energy here. Okay, this is the Grace Church and this is the Church of Pergamos. The stomach and the lungs, the stomach and breathing communication, it's, there's a blockage. There's a blockage. Could happen to do, maybe the blockage is faith. Maybe the blockage had something to do with the faith, the heart. But something has been resolved between these two factions of the spirit. Something has been resolved and also been resolved between this and this, between me and this, the Church of Philadelphia and the Church of Sardis. There has been a blockage there, there that has been removed. Something has been resolved. Like I said, this is what this dream represents to me. When I spoke to Grace, I said, I didn't intend for this to happen. It wasn't my, I, I always intended us for, to be friends and I want this to be solved. I want this to be resolved. And it was, we, it was like this forgiveness came between us came came up and we forgave each other my sister came in and she said i apologize basically for what happened between us and that was resolved it needed to be resolved it was a spiritual conflict it was a spiritual blockage it was a stumbling block for all of us to be able to move forward to the next level now during continued the dream continued in that <coughs> after that happened Grace started to communicate with me, and I said, "Look, I need your address. I want to come, come by and see you. You know, because she had this. I could see teacups, you know, and she had these pretty white teacups with gold trims around it. And I was thinking, I would like to go and have a cup of tea with you. I want to come to your house, and I want to, you know, have a moment where we can be friends and 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 start chatting, and you know, like we used to, like how we used to communicate, only better." And so I saw, I said, I need your address. And so as she started to tell me about how to get to her house, how to get to her, her place of residence, I had a vision. I was given a vision in the in, in this situation. I saw what looked like a, a, a code. There was some kind of code that came up in my mind. Kind of reminds me of what uh, often I seem to have visions within a dream. And I saw this vision. I saw numbers. You ever see that movie Knowing with uh, Nicolas Cage? Very dark, kind of strange, kind of film, but interesting nonetheless. And in the beginning, this young girl is writing all these numbers. She's hearing numbers, and so she's writing them all down on this piece of paper, both back and front on this piece of paper. She's writing all these numbers down. In a way, it was kind of like that. And that I, when she gave me her address, I started to see all these numbers, and I was writing down these numbers on this piece of paper. It wasn't as, as intense as that, but it was, there was a lot of numbers. And then there was these codes. Like uh, I was writing, seeing this, like, a, like almost like a barcode, but not quite. And I was drawing these codes on this piece of paper as I was seeing them, as they were coming up in my mind, trying to, trying to remember what it was that I was seeing. So I was writing them down and trying to duplicate how many lines are there. How, it was like a code, like I said, writing how many lines they were in orange. The color orange, which represents this part of the body, which is, has to do with sacrifice. Um, but I was I was being very precise about writing it. It's a very complicated thing if you think about it. I was asking for her address, and I was given this all this coded information. So what that means exactly, I don't know. But what did come up after that was that we went into this conversation about how God between Grace and I and Bev, we were talking about how God orders our steps. And that's how the dream ended. We were in a conversation. We were discussing how God orders our steps, like angels on headsets. I had a friend years and years ago who said, you know, every, 
she and I weren't friends. We sat next to each other in the same dressing room when we were working on the same show. And, but we ended up becoming really, really good friends. But she said to me years, uh, uh, not, you know, a couple of years after we had become friends, she said, you know, what's the funniest thing? I had, was determined not to be your friend because people were telling me that you were crazy, <laughs> which I think is rather funny. But the, I, they were, she was being warned. She was warned by, I don't know who, the staff or other actors were saying, don't have anything to do with her. Don't have anything to do with Barbara Jean. She's crazy. And so she said she was trying really hard to stay away from me as much as possible, even though she sat next to me in the dressing room. But she said it was the fair, weirdest thing. It was like there was angels on headsets. Because every time we turned around, and it was it was like, it happened like this all the time. We kept running into each other. Like, Toronto's a big place. This is where this was. It was in Toronto. We kept running into each other. I would go to this, the market down here. I'd go to this store over there. I'd go up this way. And I kept running into her. We kept connecting it was like angels on it she said it was like angels on headsets i couldn't get away from you <laughs> so that was god determining my steps and this is what the how the dream ended i was talking to my sister and to grace about how god orders our steps let me see if i can find that verse for you just a second hold on let me put you on pause <clears throat> okay it's Psalms 37, 23. The steps of the good man are ordered by the Lord and he delights in his ways. So the Lord orders our steps. He actually directs us in so many ways. And this is what how the dream ended. I was given this word about how the Lord orders our steps. So like I said, even the things that seem inconsequential, things that seem circumstantial, um, you know, oh, that was a coincidence, a coincidental. God is ordering our steps. And they, if you have to be open to these things and so that you think, oh, that was a strange coincidence. Is Was it a coincidence? The coincidence, the word coincidence is not a kosher word. It's not a word that, that we as Christians or Jewish people or Christian people should understand or even believe in because coincidence is one of those, it's, it's a false spirit. It's what it is. It's not the spirit of God. The spirit of God orders our steps, even though they seem in small or incidental or coincidental. They're no such thing. God is ordering our steps. So the little strange, little funny little things that go on in our life, for instance, me finding these figurines and only being able to buy seven of them, although there was nine, nine of them available, I only buy seven. And then a couple of years later, a few years later, the Lord says to me, go take a closer look at those figurines, only to find out that they all matched the seven churches. It seems like, what? That's a coincidence. No, it wasn't a coincidence. I was ordered. It was an ordering of my steps. The Lord orders our steps and seems most seemingly on strangest little sort of ways. People that we run into, people we contact, the people that we speak to or speak, you know, things that happen. Um, God has God is in control of all these little things that seem so amazing. It just shows us how much he loves us. And that's the amazing thing, that when we look back at it, we can see how much God loves us. Now, um, exactly what this dream means about the Grace Church, um, my friend Grace, I'm not sure. Let's just finish reading that passage about Grace, and maybe we can get some more cleanings from it before I finish this video. Um, I may get something more from it. I don't know. But all I know is that in this dream, there was some sort of resolution that has been a stumbling block for the body, for the bride. A stumbling block has been removed or been resolved between this church and this church and this church, which is, excuse me, the Church of Philadelphia. Baptized believers are here. And some sort of resolution has been uh, resolve so that there's an energy flow. If there's anything that's any spot or wrinkle, any blemish, any any spirit, going back to that Babylon spirit, which I believe is inhabiting this spirit, the spirit of the mother of harlots, I believe is inhabiting this church. And just like this the spirit of Jezebel inhabits this church, this church that's being conflicted by the the, um, the spirit of the synagogue of Satan. This church is being conflicted with the spirit of the Antichrist spirit. This church is being um, conflicted with, um, which spirit would that be? Spirit of Sardis. The spirit of the thief. 
It's the spirit of a thief. I'm just looking over here at the scriptures and it's the spirit of the thief. The thief on the cross is the spirit of, of, of laziness. And I'll take what belongs to somebody else so that I don't have to work. That's what that spirit is being conflicted with. It's the spirit of thievery. This spirit is the spirit of fear. Uh, you know, I'm taking the narrow road. You have to take the narrow road here, people. Um, even if it means your death. This is the spirit of, like I said, the religious spirits. And so the Lord is setting us free so that there is a free flow in his bride, in his church, to be able to manipulate, maneuver, maneuver through all these spirits, all seven spirits without conflict. That's a hard thing to do because we, all of us, you know, all of us see ourselves somewhere in here. I'm part of the, the works church, you know, I'm part of this, which I grew up Lutheran, I grew up Presbyterian, and we believe in missions, we believe that da, 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 da. I grew up in the Grace Church. I, just, I don't believe in works. And I I grew up, uh, I grew up, um, you know, believing the law. I believe you know, there's conflicts between, in, in, in within ourselves about how to maneuver through all seven spirits easily and with easy flow. And I think that's what the Lord is trying to, this is maybe what I'm trying to say to you too, is that God wants us to be able to maneuver with flow between all seven spirits to be able to maneuver through everything that so when we are in it in in his temple when we are in with him in his temple we will be able to rule and reign with Christ Jesus and not have any conflict in our spirit that says no grace no grace for anybody well grace is one of the spirits we have to deal with we have to deal with that spirit within ourselves. There has to be a time for relaxation and rest and communication with our fellow man. It's part of who we are. It's the air we breathe. Okay? We have to have time for work. We have to have proper understanding. It's the heart of God. It's the heart of faith. Faith, this is the faith church. And we're faith without works is dead. You got to have your heart. You got to have a heart to breathe the works of God. And you got to be able to breathe and maneuver and manipulate through every last one of these spirits freely without conflict, without stumbling blocks, without conflict. So that when we rule and reign with Christ Jesus, we are flowing with the spirit without any conflict. Is that, that makes sense to you? So let's just finish reading the church of Sardis. It's the spirit of thievery. This is what this is. The spirit of also the church of, of, of um, this, it's a, the spirit of Babylon as well, if you think about it, because it's it's the spirit of, of um, filthy clothes, you know, if you, a filth, seduction. <coughs> and to the ancient church of Sardis write these things, say, if he that hath the seven spirits of God and the seven stars, I know thy works, that thou hast the name, that thou art, li that thou livest and art dead. Be watchful and strengthen the things which remain that are ready to die. For I have not found thy works perfect before God. Remember therefore how thou hast received and heard, and hold fast, and repent. If therefore thou shalt not watch, I will come unto thee as a thief. And thou shalt not know what hour I come upon thee. Thou hast even a few names, even in Sardis, which have not defiled their garments and have walked with me in white, for they are worthy. He that overcometh, the same shall be clothed in white raiment, and I will not blot out his name in the book of life, but I will confess his name before my father and before his angels. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says unto the churches. So it's the spirit of fornication and filthiness that they have to overcome. It's the spirit of the thief. Um... So, interesting, the Lord is, is resolving a conflict in the spirit of his bride to remove the conflict and the stumbling blocks that has been blocking the flow of energy. So I think that what I'm, I guess the, the bottom line and the conclusion I'm coming to from these two dreams that I've shared with you is that the church is going to experience even more freedom not saying that the world's going to be without conflict because the world's going even to more conflict because as the world, as we come into our peace, which is what, what Jerusalem means, and we are New Jerusalem, we are the city of peace, we are the bride of Christ. As we are coming into our peace, the world is going into chaos. 
Make sense? The more peace that we and more are we are resolved, and the more we are set free from this the spirit of chaos that's in the world. The more when, when you, I've said this before many times, when you are been cursed, when you are under a curse, and this happened to me in real life. I was under the curse of a witch in university. He sent a curse on me when I went into university. And I think that happens to a lot of people who particularly Christian people, there are witches in the university system who are putting curses on the people of God, which is why they go into the universities believing in God and come out atheists. It's just a fact. So many people go into the university, Christian, young people, and because they're not protected in the spirit, come out being atheists out of the university system. Because there are witches putting curses on people. So, I understand this. When you, and when I was in the university system, this witch, this warlock, put a curse on me. Heavy duty curse on me. And I broke free through a set of, set of, set of circumstances, situations. The Lord put me through. I was set free. This man came up to me the next day and said, he was shaking like a leaf. Oh, you're different. He was scared. He was frightened out of his mind. What happened? The curse he sent to me went back to him. When I broke free from the curse, the curse went back to the person who sent it. And this is what's going on in the world right now. The church is being set free from the curses that we have been under, from the, the spirits that have been controlling us, that Babylon spirit, that spirit of Jezebel, the spirit of, of, uh, of, of the thief, the spirit of, of, of the synagogue of Satan, of the spirit of Antichrist, the spirit of, of um, fear of death, the spirit of, of religious spirit. This, all these things are being set, we're being set free from. The Lord is breaking those curses off of us. And what it's doing, it's giving us peace. We are going into our peace. The more peace we have, the less the, the Satan can control and manipulate us. Because how does he manipulate people? He manipulates through fear. Steal, kill, and destroy. He, he, he controls through death. He controls. When you've already died in Christ, why, why should you be afraid of death? You're no longer afraid of death because you got the spirit of life. You see, Christ is giving us the spirit of peace and power and love and sound mind and Satan is no longer, it's like the walls are going up as we are being surrounded by Christ and his spirit and his seven, the seven walls and seven pillars that are, are surrounding us and setting us free from the chaos of Satan and his curses. We are being set free from that curse and as we are breaking free from the curse that Satan has over has had over us for centuries, for thousands of years. It's being broken off of us. The less he can control us, the more chaotic that spirit goes back into the world where it came from, back into those systems. Because when we break the curse of what they were sending towards us and we say, nope, not having it anymore, it goes back to who sent it, it goes back to the, to the one who originated it. And now they're going into chaos. And this is what we're seeing right now. We are seeing the church becoming more and more peaceful because we're New Jerusalem, the city of peace, the new city of peace, the new Jerusalem, which is what's called the bride. The bride is called New Jerusalem, the city of peace, because we are letting go of that chaos. We're letting go of those spirits. We're letting go of those dominions and powers and principalities that have controlled and manipulated us all these years and breaking free. And as a result, that curse is leaving us. We're being ex It's being exercised from us and it's going back to where it came from. And that's why we're seeing the world in the chaos that it's in. It's not a coincidence that all this is going on right now. Jesus said, when you see all these things, the wars and rumors of wars and all the things that are going on, don't be surprised. Why? Why is that happening? Because we, they are not in control anymore. They're not in control of us. And that's what freaking them out. Because they know once we are set free, we're going up and they're going to be left behind. And it's not going to be pretty. When the bride, that spirit of peace, is removed from the world, chaos will ensue. Chaos will occur. There will be nothing left. Christ will hide his face from mankind. I was looking at the Shroud of, Shroud of Turin. I've been looking. I love 
anything has to do with this run turn. But it's a fascinating thing. Someone brought up, I can't remember his name, but uh, how when God says said to Moses, he said, show me your glory. Moses said to God, show me your glory. And God says, I can't, nobody can see my face and survive. And, and I'm thinking God's glory is his face. One day God is going to remove his glory from the world. He, we're seeing his face now. We see the shroud of Turin. God exposed, showing us the receipt of his, this is one other th term he used, he used the term receipt, that the shroud of Turin is God's receipt, saying paid in full. And Christ came and showed us his face. We saw him face to face on earth. But one day when he takes his bride out of here, his glory will be removed. You will not hear the voice of the bride and the bridegroom any longer in the world at that particular time during that terrible seven years of horror, horror that's going to occur on earth. God is going to hide his face, hide his glory and remove his bride who is his voice and his glory on earth. The woman is the glory of the man. Did you know that? So we are his glory. And when he removes his glory, we who are, who are full of his spirit, He's going to take us out and the world will have to face the chaos that they've created. They're going to face the consequences of all the chaos and the, the nuttiness and the hypocrisies and the lawlessness that they created. And they're going to have to live with it themselves. We will not have to experience it. We're not here for God's wrath. We will not experience it because God will remove us and let them deal with the mess that they made for themselves and see they are still in the university of the knowledge of good and evil. We will be, we all have graduated. Think of it that way. When God raptures his church, raptures his bride out of here, we'll have graduated, but they're still stuck. In the, in the University of the Knowledge of Good and Evil, and they're still on the bottom rung for most part. Most of them having graduated kindergarten because they're that, they're, they're stunted in their growth. And it's going to be a real wake-up call and a, a real instant education, if you will, once the bride is removed. Look what happens. I'm going to go and finish with this, I think. Let's just go look at what happens when the, when the bride is removed. Revelation chapter six, six, just the sixth seal, when the Lord removes his church, uh, the sixth seal, which matches Matthew 24, <clears throat> Revelation 6, 12, and I beheld when he'd opened the sixth seal and know there was a great earthquake and the sun became black as sackcloth of the air. What does that mean? When it means the Jesus Christ, the sun in the sky represents the sun that shines down on, on us with his warmth and his purity, and his beauty, and his light. He is the way, the truth, and the light. And there's a song that goes, just follow the sun. Just follow the sun. I think it was George Harrison who wrote that song. Um, Someday you'll find that I have gone, but tomorrow may rain, so I'll follow the sun. I think it was George Harrison who wrote that song. But that sun in the sky represents represents the son of god it's not a coincidence that they're, they sound the same and they're almost spelt the same sun and sun he is the light and one day that sun will be darkened why will the sun dark because the lord will hide his face jesus will hide his face when he raptures his church and takes us out of here he will hide his face and people will have to deal with the darkness that they have produced they will not see his glory and his bride who is foyer full of his glory will also be removed. The bride and the bridegroom will not, you will not see us and they will have to deal with the chaos that they have created for themselves. That's why we are at peace and they're at war. The more at peace we could become, the more chaotic they become. The curse is being broken from us and it's being sent back to where it came from. So that's what's going on. The more peace that we are at, the more chaos they're in. <clears throat> and when, he, when I, I beheld, when he had opened the sixth seal, and lo, there was a great earthquake, and the sun became as black as sackcloth of hair, and the moon became as blood. The moon, we represent the moon, the bride of Christ. We are standing on the moon. The moon means that we are completely blood. Why is the moon becoming blood? The red heifer. 
without one spot or wrinkle. Every hair is the color of red. Even the nose is red and the hooves are red. Why? Because we're completely covered in the blood. Every spot and wrinkle is done away with. Every controlling spirit and manipulative demon that has controlled the church for so long, that curse is being broken off of us. And the stars of heaven fell out onto the earth, even as a fig tree casts her untimely figs when she is shaken of a mighty wind. And the heavens departed as a scroll when it is rolled together. And every mountain and island were moved out of their place. And the kings of the earth and the great men, <clears throat> the great men and every bondsman, uh, the great men and the rich men and the chief captains and the mighty men and every bondsman and every free man hid themselves in the den, the rocks and the mountains, and said of the rocks and mountains and rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face of him that sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. We are not appointed to wrath, for the great day of his wrath has come, and who shall be able to stand? Could be a nuclear war. Maybe they're preparing for a nuclear war. We know they've got underground bunkers, and this is where they're all going to run and hide. You think, okay, once that happens, guess what? We're not going to be here for it. The Lord promises we're not going to be here for it. Next chapter, chapter 7, you see the 144,000 being sealed before this great destruction falls upon the earth. They're sealed with the name of the Father. And then after that, we see in Revelation chapter 7, we see this great multitude in heaven that no man can number. Why can't any man number them? It's not because he can't go 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. No, it's because we are sealed with the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. That's the Church of Philadelphia. We are sealed with the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We cannot receive a number. It is not possible for us to receive a number because we've been sealed with the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Although those and those who are left behind, who managed to get, who stay alive to the point where when the Antichrist desecrates the third temple, He's going to insist that if you don't take his number, which is three numbers, six, six, six. If you're not sealed with the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, you will be tempted to take the number, which is six, six, six. That's what you're going to have to face if you're left behind. This group in heaven that no man can number. Six is the number of man. He's trying to number you with his number so that you will be eternally damned. Six, six, six. But this group in heaven who have been raptured in Revelation chapter 6, the sixth seal, has been removed because we have been sealed with the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And no man can number us. No man could put a number on us. We've overcome the synagogue of Satan, which is what it says in the Church of Philadelphia. We overcome the synagogue of Satan. They will, God will make them come and worship before our feet. Who's going to be worshiping at that third temple? The synagogue of Satan. Who are the pillars in the temple? The Church of Philadelphia. Jesus said, go into all the world and baptize them in what? In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We've been sealed with a guarantee that no man can number us. So this is a great, this is wonderful. Just look it up for yourself. Fabulous, fabulous, fabulous. In fact, let's just finish up, finish up this, this, this um, video and let's just read. How about Jesus said, go into all the world and baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Matthew 28, 18. And this is before he was taken up. He says, one of the last things he says to the disciples of God, his, his apostles. Matthew 28, 18. And Jesus came and spoke unto them, saying, all power is given unto me in heaven and earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. So that we are going to be set free from the spirit of Babylon, from the spirit, the holy spirit of Babylon, from the spirit of Antichrist, and from Satan, say, the synagogue of Satan. We will not; they will not have power over us. We are being set free from their manipulation and control, so that there's a free, free flow of energy, and we will be one and whole. Everything will be, we will be, perfect.
without spot or blemish. And he will present us to his father, the new Jerusalem, the city of peace. Isn't that amazing? That's amazing stuff, people. We are, we are so blessed. Let's just read about the Church of Philadelphia. That one little, little bit. It says about how he's going to make them come and worship at our feet. Revelation 3, 9. Behold, I will make them of the synagogue of Satan, which say they are Jews and are not, but do lie. Behold, I will make them come and worship before thy feet and to know that I have loved thee. So a synagogue, these, these people, the Jews. Isn't that interesting? He's going to make them build a temple. The third temple, he's going to force them. He's going to get them. They, some of them don't want to. A lot of Jews don't want a third temple, but they're going to have to be. They're going to have to build one anyway because he's going to force them to worship worship at our feet. Those who are of the synagogue of Satan. Now, I'm saying that all Jews are of the synagogue of Satan. Those who have rejected Jesus Christ, they have made themselves aligned to those who have got blood on their hands, and that's the blood of their Messiah. Okay, they haven't yet repented. God, they're still under a heavy, heavy, heavy heavy curse. They're under a heavy curse, which is why God calls them the synagogue of Satan, because they have not aligned themselves with Jesus Christ, and who is the Son of God, their Messiah. But he's going to force them to come and worship at our feet. Isn't that interesting? And that's when they build a third temple. Whether they like it or not, there's going to be a third temple. But hold on, we'll make them come and make them. He's going to force them to come and worship before thy feet and to know that I have loved thee because thou hast kept the word of my patience. I will make, also keep you from the hour of temptation. We are removed from the hour of wrath. That's what the sixth seal is all about, removing us from the day of wrath. And when he hides his face, he will hide his glory. He's going to hide the glory of the sun to represent in the physical realm what's happened in the spirit realm. Jesus has turned his face from them, he's going to hide his glory, and shall come up, uh, which shall come upon all the world to try them which dwell upon the earth. Behold, I come quickly. Hold fast which thou hast, that no man take thy crown. Him that overcometh will I make a pillar in the temple of my God, and he shall go no more out. And I'll write upon him the name of my God, the name of the city of my God, which is New Jerusalem, which comes out of heaven from my God, and I will write upon him my new name, Father, Son. Holy Spirit. Not six, six, six. It's impossible. That is why it's impossible for Satan to to install the mark of the beast. Now, at this moment, it's impossible. He can't do it. Why can't he do it? Because we're still here. And no man can number us. So he, God is not going to allow him to install his 666 system until the church is gone. Because it's not possible. He will not allow it. So anybody who's taken the the V, don't be worried that you that was the mark of the beast because it was not. Because the church, the bride of Jesus Christ, will not be here, cannot. This system cannot, the 666 system cannot, cannot occur until the bride is removed. Because no man numbers. Anyway, <coughs> that's all I'm going to say. I, oh, I, I went down a road that I wasn't sure, I wasn't intending to, but it should be interesting. I don't know if the Lord is going to reveal to me what those numbers and the symbols and the code. That's interesting. I said it was like, kind of like a barcode and I was counting the, counting the, the lines that I was drawing and they were in, in orange. Orange represents this color here which is actually just turned and looked at the clock and it's the first time in over an hour since I've been on an hour and a half and I turned and looked at the card the number says 444 <laughs> shocked me first, if it's funny how you know you get you, you get prompted go look at the clock and that must have been just what happened right now I I was talking to you and blah 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 and I heard look at the clock and I looked and 444 it wasn't even in my mind to think to look at the clock. <clears throat> A triple fours. Four is four, the city four square. Number four is the number of foundations. It's the number of four walls being protected. <clears throat> so like the, the number of the 
grace, grace is the number five, is the number five, is the number for grace, four is the number of the city, four square, the new Jerusalem. It's a city of foundations, it's a city of protection, being protected by four walls. <clears throat> so maybe the Lord is giving us a little hint there too, that we are, we are now become the city of peace, that we are resolving these issues <clears throat> within ourselves to be able to understand that we have to have a flow of energy that's without stumbling block or blockages, but that we will one day <clears throat> be the pillars in the temple of God. And uh, we're very close to it. Perhaps that's what the Lord is saying, that the city of, of the new Jerusalem is, is upon us and that the temple that they're getting preparing to be built, we're not going to be here to see it. We're going to be up in the spiritual temple. <coughs> so anyway, um, anyway, that's all I'm going to say. Just some interesting things to see. I've been pondering. It's some things that have been happening. So I will talk to you later. God bless and have a blessed day. Oh, by the way, happy Thanksgiving to my Canadian, uh, fellow Canadian um, truthers. It's Thanksgiving. Oh, <laughs> they've decided to change Thanksgiving Day to Harvest Day. I guess it's it's politically incorrect to be thankful because now it's now Happy Harvest Day. <laughs> Talk about silliness and chaotic and hypocrisies and you know Satan is so stupid. Nonetheless, Happy Thanksgiving, Happy Thanksgiving to everyone out there who. A song that came to my mind was Give Thanks with a Grateful Heart. Give Thanks to the Holy One. Give Thanks because He's given Jesus Christ His Son. Give Thanks with a Grateful Heart. Give Thanks with a Holy to the Holy One. Give thanks because he's given Jesus Christ his Son. And now let the weak say I am strong. Let the poor say I am rich because of what the Lord has done for us. <laughs> That's the song that came to my mind this morning as I was getting ready to um, make this video. So God bless. And uh, happy Thanksgiving to all. God bless and talk to you later.